some of the people that I, I work with. So um, on, uh, this is me, Young Choi, Joe Coleman, um, Amber Alt, and this is Matthew Fong, Brandon Lee, um, some undergraduates from UTD who I'll, who I'll mention as well. And this is um, Becky Cannon, who is an Einstein Fellow at Stanford, and she I, I work with her a lot too, and Helen Russell, who is a, a postdoc in, in Cambridge. So in the background image, um, there is, this is a, a galaxy cluster, and the features that you can see in the background are gravitationally lensed distant galaxies. So most of my talk is going to be about gravitational lensing. So we're going to start with uh, a, a brief introduction to cosmology and, and lensing. I wasn't sure how many people in the audience didn't do very much cosmology, so just a very quick overview. And then I'll talk a bit about an investigation of a galaxy cluster merger, ABEL 2146, that we've been doing a lot of um, like observational work on and now doing some kind of um, simulations of, of this system. And then I will move on to individual galaxy clusters and I'll talk a bit about prospects for using galaxy clusters as cosmological tools. And what we actually need to do in order to realize um, galaxy clusters as cosmological tools will involve considering models for clusters that are beyond like purely dark matter, you know, spherically symmetric models. So I'll talk a bit about our work in that area. And if there's time, I will talk a bit about um, studying modified gravity with, with galaxy clusters. We'll see how we're doing for, for time. Okay, so as you all know, um, our, our picture of, of cosmology is that we started with a period of very rapid expansion known as inflation. And the furthest back we can see directly is uh, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang to the cosmic microwave background. And so here we are um, about 14 billion years um, after, after that time. And one of the goals of cosmology is to figure out how did we go from the very small fluctuations in mass that we see at that time to the structures that we see around us today. And so this structure formation um, depends on uh, cosmological parameters. So we can use um, different probes of, of um, the universe. So for instance, the cosmic microwave background, um, supernovae that you will all have heard of, um, X-ray observations, gravitational lensing being uh, some of the tools, and together um, they give us a model of the universe where about three quarters is in the form of um, dark energy, and most of the matter is in a form that is we think is cold and dark, and we can actually see directly um, through electromagnetic radiation. So basically, most of the universe is 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 dark. And I looked up um, dark matter and dark energy on the internet in order to educate myself. And basically, um, you can have dark matter or dark energy as some kind of like you know, useful drink. Unfortunately, if life were only that easy. Um, so so the, the classical evidence for dark matter, as, as you're all aware of, comes from um, Swicky studies in the 1930s of the speeds of galaxies in, inside galaxy clusters, and essentially the speeds are too high to be accounted for by just the presence of, of luminous matter. And then, of course, you know, work that was pioneered by um, Vera Rubin 
um, looking at the rotation speed of, of gas in galaxies as a function of distance from the center, and the measurements of the rotation speeds are higher than what we would um, expect if we only had luminous matter that was providing the gravity to keep this stuff in, in motion. And then, um, so if we, if we think about, um, if we look at um, cosmological simulations, and if you would do cosmological simulations with um, different amounts of dark matter and different amounts of dark energy, then you know, we see structures forming from, you know, from the earliest times, and they build up in a way, structures grow in a way that depends on the amount of dark matter and dark energy that we have there. And this um, result from, from Viglinen et al. Um, shows that if we measure the like, massive halos, so massive objects, uh, the number as a function of mass, and we make predictions for the numbers that we would expect in models where we have dark energy and in models where we don't have dark energy, then the right-hand panel shows for a model with no dark energy that the um, highest redshift clusters are not you know, agreeing with the predictions for no dark energy um, to give the, the, right, the appropriate numbers of, of galaxy clusters. So basically the upshot of this is, is that um, looking at objects that, that probe, um, you know, counting the numbers of objects as a function of their mass and, and their redshift is a good tool for um, learning more about the contents of, of the universe. So going into um, individual, into individual um, halos, and these are some from the Millennium simulations from Volker Sprimo, um, we can also look at the distribution of mass inside individual halos. So look at you know, how mass is distributed, how, what the density looks like as a function of, of the distance from the center. And the, uh, a good model which describes halos that are formed in cold dark matter simulations is something like the navarro franken white profile, or maybe more recently, the Inasto profile. But basically, by also looking at how mass is distributed inside objects, we can also learn about the, the properties of, of dark matter. So my um, main tool for, for um, investigating um, objects is, is gravitational lensing. And how many of you haven't heard of gravitational lensing or know very much about it? I guess you've all heard of it. Okay. So basically, um, so the idea is light rays are deflected, and so we have light from a distant source. Um, because a massive object distorts the space time around it, light rays travel towards us and we can get multiple images or single distorted images of background galaxies. And um, we can use the, the properties of the, the images that are formed in order to learn about the mass that's doing the gravitational lensing. So lensing operates on uh, different scales in the universe. And I wanted to give you an example, before I move on to galaxy clusters, of lensing on a rather small scale, and that this is um, some work that's been done by some undergrads at UTD looking at microlensing by um, binary black holes. And essentially um, what they're doing is, what's shown in this picture is um, a source um, moves along this line and this is in the vicinity of a, a binary black hole. And as the source moves closer in alignment to the binary black hole, then what we get are multiple images being formed of the source. And the, if we look at the magnification of the light as a function of where the source is, then basically, um, if I look at the magnification as a function of time, we can look at the difference between what the magnification would be if we had a single lens compared with um, having a, a binary black hole. So what the undergrads are doing is they are looking at um, how, you know, what, what kind of accuracy do, do we need in photometry in order to figure out you know, what, what sorts of binary black holes could we detect using um, gravitational microlensing. So this is like in the context of, of future surveys. So essentially the, the um, kind of pattern that you see here with all, all the bumps 
is due to the fact that we have a, a binary black hole and you know it's like rotating and then as as we get the the, the two um, the, the black holes actually in alignment or out of alignment then we get a different amount of magnification. This is really um, I think very nice work by the undergraduates. So what kind of masses um, so those are stellar mass, um, so, sort of like, you know, the normal, sort of like, so not supermassive black holes, but the normal um, kind of stellar masses that they've been, been looking at. Um, so, um, so the regimes of, of gravitational lensing are, so if we have a, a massive galaxy cluster, then as you know, um, if we are in good alignment with the cluster, looking towards the center, then we get multiple images, and then moving further out to the periphery of the cluster, we get weak lensing, which must be studied statistically because we get very, very slight distortions of the images of, of background galaxies. So the important thing is that the deflection angle is actually proportional to the gradient of the, the, the lensing potential, and so it's insensitive to whether the mass is luminous or, or dark. And so we can write down the lens equation that relates the source and, and the image positions to this, this deflection angle. So, so galaxy clusters are interesting to study. They're the most massive um, found objects in the universe. And more than 80% of their mass is dark matter. And so they can be studied you know, across a range of, of different wavelengths, so optical and x-ray, for, for example. And uh, we think they are uh, really good laboratories to study um, dark matter and baryons, and also as cosmological probes and tests of the laws of, of gravity. So this is from a, um, some simulations just to show the composition of a typical galaxy cluster, so density as a function of radius. And near the very, very centers, we are dominated by um, light from stars, and as we go further and further out, then eventually the, the dark matter becomes the dominant component. So when we're looking at strong lensing, we're actually looking at the inner regions where, where there tends to be a, a lot of, 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 of stellar um, mass. And then when we look at weak lensing, we're in a regime where, where we're dominated by, by dark matter. Okay, so if we want to um, use galaxy clusters, we need to know um, how massive um, real galaxy clusters actually are in order to put them on that plot of you know, number um, against, against um, mass as a function of redshift. And we would also like to know how their mass is distributed, which is where um, gravitational lensing comes in. Okay, so a couple of, just a couple of, of quick points um, when we talk about a cluster acting as a gravitational lens, the two important quantities are the convergence and the shear. So basically, if I have a, a background circular source, then the convergence is essentially a scaled um, surface mass density, so taking the lens, projecting the mass, and looking at surface mass density. And the convergence actually isotropically um, magnifies Whereas we need um, some shear, so a tidal gravitational field, in order to actually distort the image. So when we have a, a lens, you know, we have a convergence and a shear, and it's those two things together that actually will give us the, the, the corresponding images. And basically then, a magnification of a point source is related to the convergence and, and the shear as well. Okay. So we can um, use in in the this. So we can use in the centers of, of galaxy clusters. We can use the giant arcs that, that we see near to the cluster centers in order to map the mass. And I'll show an example of that in, in um, a few slides time. And um, we can use um, weak gravitational lensing to look at the mass in the periphery. Um, so basically, the idea is is that. If I look at the um, average of the shapes of the galaxies, that gives me a measure of the tidal gravitational field, so it gives me a measure of, of, of the shear. And then um, we can go from the components of the shear that we actually measure, and we can reconstruct a map of the cluster's um, mass distribution 
or we can actually fit directly to the shear and get a parameterized model. So we can either map the mass using um, techniques based on, say, Fourier transforms, or we can fit parameterized models. So uh, a nice um, picture to illustrate this is that the, the sticks are actually the shear around a galaxy cluster, and this just shows the corresponding map of the mass. So isn't weak lensing sensitive to all the mass along the line of sight? Yeah. So, so how do you know the mass is actually associated with the cluster? Right. So with galaxy clusters, um, if we look at very massive clusters, then we would say that the mass is dominated by a galaxy cluster. But otherwise, yes, we have to take into account the fact that, um, and one thing I'll talk about is actually triaxiality, even in galaxy clusters themselves, and the fact that that actually, you know, um, large scale structure and even the structure for clusters themselves does actually impact on the lensing. I'll, I'll come on to that in, in a little bit. We all believe that. Uh lensing uh, happens, um, and so there could be more mass here than someplace else. Does the analysis give us the, uh, the relative amounts of mass or the absolute, or is it somewhat also modeled? It's somewhat, so for some of the weak lensing models, you make some assumptions when you, when you make your maps about what is going on at the edge of the field that you're, that you're mapping. And so, for instance, if you have a wide field image of a galaxy cluster, um, you might assume that at the edge of the field, you have kind of like the average, um, like the average density. So, so there are, um, going into these like maps and these models, there are often like, yeah, assumptions about the, the background that you actually have the lens on top of. And so it's not generally such a problem for like wider fields of view and so on, because I think that's a fair, you know, to it, assume that. Th those of us that don't work on this might see some numbers and say, okay, these are smart people, I'll just have to take it at face value. But the insiders might say, ah, well, a lot is packed into this number. Yeah, and also like one of the things that I'll talk about is even things like the three dimensions, like the projections of the clusters themselves will impact on, on, on the lensing signal and on the measurements. Okay, so the first um, topic is I'm going to talk about is in a bit more detail is colliding galaxy clusters, so cluster mergers. And these are relatively rare um, systems. And I don't know if this is going to play, let's see. Um, this is an animation um, of two co colliding galaxy clusters, which is going to represent the, the bullet cluster, the original bullet cluster from Doug Flow and collaborators. So what we'll be looking at is here we have dark matter and baryons all mixed together. And when the clusters collide, what you'll see is a, a segregation of the dark matter and the baryons, um, because we think dark matter is relatively like um, you know, a low cross-section for, for collisions, whereas the baryons have different physics and they're going to like, you know, behave differently during this merger. So let's have a look at what, let's see if this works. Okay, so there we go. Um, so the bullet cluster, the original bullet cluster, has a mass ratio of about 10 to one, and that's why one of these things is much um, bigger than the other. And basically what you can see at the end is the dark matter on the outskirts, and in the center we have the, um, the dominant baryonic component, which is actually the plasma, the hot plasma, which is the dominant baryonic component inside clusters. So this is the original um, bullet cluster, and basically here from, from Doug Clow, um, the background is an optical image, the green contours are a weak lensing, a mass reconstruction, and on this panel, um, what is shown in the orangey color, orange and, and blue, is a, um, the X-ray emission from, from the, the plasma. So a map of where, essentially, most of the baryons are. The really important thing about this system is that you know, people had been saying, oh well, maybe um, gravity is different, maybe like, you know, we, we can get away with explaining um, gravity without dark matter if it somehow behaves differently on, on large scales. So I think 
when, when we can see that you know where most of the baryons are is offset from the peaks in the mass, that's a really nice illustration that um, there must be some kind of dark matter. Okay, so that um, has a mass ratio of, of 10 to 1 or so. And um, Helen Russell, during her, her um, PhD thesis with Andy Fabian in Cambridge, discovered uh, another um, and a very nice example of a cluster merger system with the, these are Chandra observations. And so what we've been doing since then is to make a, a study using different wavelengths <coughs> and now I'm trying to do some simulations of, of this system. The interesting, really interesting thing about this system is that um, on the X-ray images, um, two shocks are actually observed, whereas in the vast majority of the merger systems, we only see one shock. And we think this is because it's consistent with the masses of the two clusters that have collided being rather more similar to each other. So you know, from that kind of symmetry, there would be no reason to expect you know, different kinds of properties in, in, in the X-ray. Where's the second shock? Um, so the, well, one is up oh, okay. here and one is down. Oh, I can't see it. Though. Yeah. So here, um, so on this map, um, this is what we think is the the bullet. So this is the component that that seems to be from the X-ray moving faster. Um, and so there is a a shock. Like a, I'll show you like later okay. the X-ray maps, but one down here and one up here. So um, from the X-ray images, since this is the, the bullet component, we would expect that that cluster would be um, less massive, you know, because of two things that kind of come together, then we would expect that this is the less massive component, you know, moving faster under, under the same um, acceleration, and, and, and sorry, under the same um, forces between them. And so essentially we would have thought that this would turn out to be the um, le least massive on, on the lensing map. So, so let's look at the, the lensing analysis. Um, so we have some Hubble Space Telescope um, data. And what's very interesting from the Hubble Space Telescope data and comparison with the Chandra is that um, when we look at the location, and now this is looking at the, the bullet component, um, when we look at the location of the peak in the, the Chandra data, so that the core of, of the emission, it is offset but in the direction that we wouldn't have expected, so it's leading rather than lagging behind the, 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 the brightest cluster galaxy, if that makes sense. So because um, we do see um, two shocks in the X-ray, um, and because of other dynamical arguments, this is kind of very difficult to understand why, because you know later in a merger we might get some kind of run pressure slingshot, which could put the the baryons ahead of, of the dark matter. You know, if, if we have a, a collision and the things are coming back again essentially, but because of time scale arguments, this is this seems like a puzzling offset. So we want to see with gravitational lensing, is the gravitational lensing, does that give us a a peak that is here, or does it give us a peak you know, somewhere more consistent with, with the X-ray or ahead of, of the, the X-ray? Okay, so we've looked, done a um, dynamical analysis of, of the system, and this was done by um, an undergraduate, Jacob White, who is now doing his PhD at, at UBC, so he's now working on, on um, ALMA and, and planets, and so what, what Jacob has done um, is analyzed um, da data that um, Becky Canning took with um, the Gemini um, telescope, Gemini North, and essentially um, he has identified from spectroscopy, shown in red here, um, he's got redshifts for a lot of the cluster members and then identified things which are not actually in the cluster, and he has found a, um, a total mass of almost 10 to the 15 solar masses, and a mass ratio between the components of about three to one, which from the, you know, the, the structure like that we see in X-ray is, is, you know, we would have expected kind of comparable mass components. So interestingly, the component that is the bullet, the one that seems to be faster moving, 
um, seems to be the higher mass component in, in this analysis. And we find that the angle to the plane of the sky, so the angle at which we're seeing this collision, is relatively low, less than about 20 degrees. And the time since the um, clusters have passed through each other is relatively short on cosmological scales, so about 0 0.5, 0 0.25 or 0 0.26 um, giga years. So this is a relatively recent um, merger. So, um, so now on to the, the lensing analysis. So, so basically, um, with the gravitational lensing analysis, we have to first take into account the fact that um, not, not such a problem if we have Hubble Space Telescope data, but um, um, if we're on, on ground, we have to take into consideration what the Earth's atmosphere does to the shapes of distant galaxies because we're looking for distortions in, in, very, um, in the shapes and of course what the telescope optics do, which is important for um, cameras on, on the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, the first thing to do is to correct the shapes of distant galaxies for um, the, the distortions you know, due to the optics and so on. And um, that is, is usually done by using the images of stars in the field, measuring their shapes. You know, they should be circular and applying those corrections across the field to the, 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 the galaxy's shapes. Um, we have to select background galaxies because we don't have, you know, we had um, spectra for a number of cluster members, but that's just the, the brightest galaxies. So to select background populations, um, we have to look at, you know, the, the um, plots of um, color color plots on the Hubble Space Telescope data. And here um, in this kind of like, uh, there's a, a darker line here, this black um, set of points. That would be the cluster sequence, so where most of the you know the galaxies in the clusters have evolved very similarly, so they tend to be on some pretty well defined cluster sequence. And then um, these lines here show the um, tracks for um, for different sorts of um, uh, single star bursts and for an exponential. Um, exponential um, starburst starting at a redshift of six and how that would evolve with redshift and what that lets us do is actually exclude um, objects that we think are in the foreground of, of, the, of the gravitational lens. So then basically um, we can make our maps of the mass using, using um, different techniques and this is basically work um, I've been doing with, with, with Doug Clough and some other people. So basically, um, what the three different sets of contours show is um, the weak lensing mass map. And why we've got three different sets of contours is we took different selections of background galaxies just because you know we can't, we can't be 100% sure because we don't have spectroscopy, so we're using photometry. And so we have various different, like more or less conservative cuts on what we think are background objects. But basically, the, the most conservative and the least conservative selection are consistent with each other in terms of what we get for the map of the mass. And it gives um, the upper component here, which is actually flipped from the, the earlier images, that would be the, the most massive, whereas um, the mass distribution in, in, down in the other cluster is rather more um, elongated. And we can do um, bootstrap analysis of the um, Hubble Space Telescope data, and we can um, you know, look at how often do we get a peak near this location in those um, bootstrapped catalogs, how often do we get a peak near here, how often do we get a peak near here, and that helps us um, you know, figure out that the, the peak up here and the, the mass around here is very well constrained, whereas um, down in this region, um, you know, some, some of the reconstructions would give you a peak here, some of the reconstructions would give you a peak here, and that's because there's less mass there in order to um, give you the weak lensing signal. So basically the conclusion of this is that, um, yeah, so we can, uh, the conclusion of this then um, is that the masses of these clusters, um, if we assume um, different values for the concentrations, 
um, are going to be of order of you know, around 10 to the 15 solar masses for the most massive cluster and a few times less for the, the, the lower mass cluster. Um, and so with, with weak lensing, as you might notice, the resolution that we can get in, in this, like in the inner regions, because we have to average over many galaxies in order to beat down the noise from the fact that they have um, intrinsic shapes that we have to average over, then um, once we've done that averaging, we have a typical, you know, a, a resolution that we are, you know, we can, can be happy that we can um, measure mass down to. So with weak lensing, we get a good picture of the overall kind of distribution of mass, whereas we look to strong lensing in order to actually um, look at the distribution of mass at a higher resolution towards the inner regions of the, the galaxy cluster. What's the redshift of this cluster again? Um, it's about point, point 0.23 two, three something. So, so basically here, um, this is the brightest cluster galaxy in that, you know, the, the strong peak in the weak lensing map. And I've circled here, and here, here, and here. Um, I don't know if you can see, there are some things that look like little Vs here. So the students call these bra and cats. And I thought they looked like chicken feet. So, um, so basically, these um, objects here are corresponding like multiple images of each other. So they're likely multiple images of a distant, um, a distant group. We have another pair up here, like a, a, you can see the mirror symmetry if we would draw a line down through here. Um, this feature here also looks to be a gravitational lens, like a distant group. And again, if we draw a line roughly through the middle, we see some um, mirror symmetry. So basically, um, what you can do, what what one of the um, one of my graduate students, Joe Coleman, has been doing, is to actually look at all the multiple image systems in this field and to do a strong lensing analysis. So a strong lensing um, reconstruction of the inner regions. And basically, um, what what's important here is that so these kind of like elongated curves here are um, caustics and they, they look rather offset from the mass distribution because of you know we have another cluster so we have a lot of um, shear in the system and the important things are the curves these curves that you can see here and around the cluster uh, which are the, the critical curves of the cluster so um, from this reconstruction we can tell that the center of the mass that's responsible for those multiple image systems is actually very well located <coughs> close to the, the brightest cluster galaxy itself. So the brightest cluster galaxy and the, the peak in the, the strong lensing are consistent with each other and they are offset from the, the Chandra um, um, location which is, is more up into, into this location. So um, okay, that's just a map of the mass in, in the system. And again, you can see that, well, the, there is more mass up in this component um, consistent with what we have from, from weak lensing. Um, some work that has, has just started from some um, of the undergrads at UTD, so Autumn Hall, Jules Donaghy, Alexis Fuchs, and Brandon Stevenson, and um, Will Dawson from Lawrence Livermore are um, to use Will's um, Monte Carlo code, which was written specifically for cluster mergers, in order to get a better idea, a better handle on the, the um, dynamics of the system. So whenever um, Jacob has done his analysis, it was assumed that the clusters were kind of like were um, point masses, and you know they. That, so this has a lot of approximations in, in that kind of study. So the, the, the next step is to look at using um, Will's MC Mac code, and and what goes into there is that um, an assumption that the clusters are modeled by um, NFW profiles, which are then um, colliding, and so. Um, when you then um, do a, a Monte Carlo of, of that process, 
you rely on you know like knowing the, the final masses of the clusters with some errors and you know the final like the angle of the sky with some errors and then what this does is it will generate um, all the, the possible sorts of um, combinations of parameters that would be consistent with your observations and here um, some preliminary work the undergrads um, sent me this is their first pass at the time since collision. So um, Jacob's results were something around you know, these kinds of values. And so it seems kind of consistent, maybe a little bit higher than, than what Jacob was finding. And this is like literally they sent it to me over Thanksgiving. And so uh, we have to talk about it when I get back tomorrow. Um, so what we are going to do with this system next is like, um, um, some really nice work has been done on the bullet cluster by Craig um, Lash and Glenis Farrar. And basically, um, if you have all, lots of kind of observational data for a system, and if you do a simulation, you can compare then the results of, um, you know, like simulations with the results of, of observations. And um, shown here from, from um, Craig's work are um, some, the, the um, a lensing mass map for the bullet cluster, what the simulation, their best fit simulation gives. And um, you know, here, just to show you a line cut through the, the simulations and the data, the data is in, in blue and the simulations is in red. So in other words, doing simulations that, you know, if you collide them at specific angles and they have original, you know, particular original masses, uh, velocities, and so on, to try to fit the um, lensing data, to try to fit the um, X-ray data, to try to fit, if you have um, Sonia Soldovich data, um, to try to fit, you know, as, as many of the observational data sets as possible. So, so basically, um, we are going, we have, you know, we're about to start to do um, some simulations um, using Romain Tessier's um, Ramsey's code. And, and basically, what we want to do with that is use all the observations that we've made, the lensing analysis, um, the x-ray analysis, the, we have um, information from SZ and radio as well, and to use that in order to actually um, constrain the simulations and to look at how, how do the dark and luminous um, components in this system um, evolve with time. So one of the things we can look at is whether, um, if you look at, at this map, this is the um, like a, an X-ray cool core in, in one of the clusters, and there's been a suggestion from Helen's um, X-ray analysis that before the merger, this other cluster might have had a cool core as well. And we think that during um, cluster mergers, if a cluster is more, um, like is less, is, is less concentrated, then it could be more easily disrupted during a merger. And there's evidence from the X-ray um, that, that perhaps there was a core in this system that was destroyed during the merger. So by looking at the, you know, by doing simulations, we can tell whether it's, that is consistent with there being a core in one of these systems before the merger. And that also comes back to the point that the distribution of mass around this cluster looks to be more elongated than the distribution of mass around the cluster down here. So we can investigate, you know, starting with original components, um, how do they evolve with time, and if that cluster was, was actually less concentrated, would it be kind of more um, affected by the merger? Okay, so moving on to um, individual galaxy clusters. Um, so we, we mentioned before that clusters can be used in cosmology. I thought this was some really nice uh, work by um, Adam Mance and, and collaborators, and essentially looking at the constraints on um, sigma ed against omega matter, and looking at the evolution in time of you know, how uh, improvements in data sets are actually improving how the, what constraints we can get on parameters. And so this, 
these are all constraints from Adam Mans and the and, and his group going from 2008 down to through to 2014. So you can see that things are improving um, with with time. And um, also from from that that work, um, this is looking at the equation of state parameter for for dark energy, where if we have a cosmological constant then that equation of state parameter should be um, minus one. And this is just to show that by combining different cosmological, but combining different cosmological tools, a lot of them have you know, degeneracies in different, uh, in different directions, but the combinations of tools are you know, very strong compared with, with individual tools. So it helps to break degeneracies if we use different tools. So basically, um, prospects for um, for the, the LSST um, that is going to be um, taking verification data in about 2021, I think it is. So basically here, um, but when we talk about weak lensing, what we normally mean is, is cosmic shear, so that is the, the blue solid um, barren acoustic oscillation, so, so galaxy clusters would give us this kind of constraint. And this is looking at a um, model for dark energy where we have a value of the equation of state parameter today and then allowing for the evolution of the equation of state parameter. So basically this is what we might expect with the, uh, in the era of, of LSST. So in terms of galaxy clusters, uh, we expect to have about 20,000 clusters and to measure their masses to about 10% um, accuracy um, for massive clusters of about um, over about 1.5 by 10 to the 14 solar masses. So, uh, so the question is that we can get, um, if we stack galaxy clusters and look at their average signal, we can get a better understanding of the um, average mass distributions of clusters but if we want to look at um, individual clusters, then uh, we really need to look at a few different factors that can impact on how those clusters act as gravitational lenses. So this is some work we've been doing for the past few years um, using um, analytic models and using computer simulations in order to look at various things like, you know, what one, um, something you mentioned was how does like large scale structure impact on, on your studies and, and so on. Um, so um, one, one such thing that, that we can look at is um, cluster triaxiality. So we know that clusters are not all like spherically symmetric. And if you would have a cluster that looks like, um, this is called a football, I think we would call it a rugby ball in the UK, anyway. So if you have something that looks like this, then if you imagine having that structure projected, you know, if it's um, got its long axis along the line of sight, or if it has a short axis along the line of sight, then the projected mass is going to be different. And actually, um, what we'll see in, in a few moments is that that can give you higher mass and concentration than is truly, you know, that, than the mass that cluster truly has um, if you fit a um, circularly symmetric model or you assume like spherical symmetry to begin with. So uh, a former graduate student of mine, Virginia Corliss, has done a lot of work on, on this topic. She has done some really good work. And basically, um, if we would look at um, 500 um, realizations of a halo, and we would take a 10 to the 15 solar mass cluster, and we would make that um, cluster spherically symmetric, or we would make it you know, have some kind of triaxial shape, that if we would have, if we would look at the distribution of parameters we would get back, you know, given some noise, we're gonna get some kind of like scatter on, on parameters, we can't measure things perfectly, but the distributions that we would get are much broader if we actually um, um, have triaxial models rather than spherical models that we're actually fitting to. And so um, a, a few years ago with um, Yannick Vai, um, who's now at MPA, and um, Ian McCarthy, we've done some work looking at um, 3,000 clusters taken from the Millennium simulations. 
And so because we've taken the clusters from simulations, we can directly look at, you know, we know their true masses in the simulations and their true concentrations. So we can um, do synthetic weak lensing analysis of those clusters and look at how the concentrations and the masses compare with what we um, have in the actual simulations. So this is the mass compared with the true mass, and this is the concentration compared with the true concentration. And basically, um, what, I'll show you the next part, it's a bit clearer. So basically, um, what we're looking at here is that the clusters up on this side, oh, there we go. Oh. Okay, so the clusters um, up, up here, which tend to have um, higher masses and higher concentrations than their true values when, when we do these um, weak lensing realizations, are clusters where um, if we look at the angle of the major axis to the line of sight, they tend to be the ones that we measure as more massive and more concentrated. So and basically we can look at um, effects such as the structure outside the cluster, so like the larger scale structure, and we can look at you know, things like the orientation of the cluster, and we can see um, what those different things impact on in terms of um, recovering the, the parameters. Okay, so one of my pictures is missing. Okay, so clusters, um, <coughs> there should be a plot here. Let's see what's going on. Okay, so clusters also have um, um, baryons, and so as well as having triaxial structure, which we can see would impact on you know, if we make measurements of individual clusters, it will impact on the measurements of individual clusters. Um, clusters also have um, um, baryons, and um, okay, this is just to show a um, convergence map of, of clusters from a simulation. And what we're doing um, with Ian McCarthy and Doug Applegate, and this is led by um, graduate student Brandon Lee, is we're actually looking at clusters that are um, dark matter only clusters, and then clusters which have um, different types of baryonic physics um, implemented in them. And um, at the end, I will try to show you this, this, this um, plot. So basically, um, if we have different amounts of um, feedback from an AGN at the center of the cluster, then that's going to lead to differences in the, the profile that we observe. And if we have differences in the density profiles, then that's going to impact on their, their lensing signatures. So, uh, the, so the basic idea is that we have some, uh, if we have dark matter and baryons, we have a cluster simulation, we can project that to form convergence maps then we can do things like calculate the shear deflection angles and so on, for example, using um, FFT. And then um, if we create synthetic background galaxy populations, we can ray trace those to give the strong lensing features like arcs or to give the, the weak, lensing, weak lensing features. And I will, uh, so some uh, work from some time ago um, using some simulations from Deborah Sajaki and Abel Puchwein um, and former graduate student James Mead, um, we showed that um, if we look at uh, bar baryonic physics where we allow cooling and star formation, but we don't have any AGN feedback, then essentially um, there is um, too high a density inside the centers of clusters. And so if we look at the production of um, the cross-section for the production of giant arcs, if we compare models where we have um, AGN feedback to those which just have cooling and star formation, um, or we can compare dark matter only to models with um, AGN feedback, um, we find statistically that for models where there is cooling and star formation but no AGN feedback, then essentially we form um, too, many, too many giant arcs, Whereas if we um, take into account um, um, some kind of AGN feedback, we get something which is really quite similar to the dark matter only 
This was a few years ago um, when we didn't have access to so many clusters and what Brandon is now doing is to repeat this for a larger sample of clusters from the Cosmo Isles simulations. Okay, so, um, so another thing we have to worry about and this is uh, work from some time ago um, with Anthony Lewis where we were interested in comparing weak lensing of the cosmic microwave background with weak lensing of galaxy populations. And what I wanted to illustrate here um, is that if we look at the, um, the, the contours, uh, these orange contours are actually the constraints on clusters that we get um, from space space data. So this is the important thing from this is that you can see going from a redshift of 0.25 for the cluster, going to 0.5, going to 1, and going to 2, the, um, the weak lensing of galaxy populations, the contours like start to blow up and eventually become kind of like really, really useless if we have, you know, rather high redshift clusters. And that's because we start to lose the populations of galaxies behind the clusters, and so we have fewer galaxies with which we can do the, the weak lensing. Um, constraints. So um, one of the um, and so you know and also this is quite ideal um, as galaxies become more and more distant and more and more small. It's more difficult to measure their shapes, and we need to measure their shapes in order to um, to do a shear analysis. So one of the things um, that th this is um, predictions for um, LSS LSST like constraints. On, and now this is still a fairly low redshift cluster, but this is what um, Liang Choi, one of my graduate students, gets from the shear information from LSST. So assuming something like a little bit less than 30 galaxies per arc minute squared, and this cluster is a redshift of about 0.2. And this is what we get if instead of the shear, we actually use um, magnification information. So looking at how the numbers of galaxies are changed um, due to the fact that the clusters will actually you know, magnify um, distant galaxies. And so you can see here that the contours for magnification are much broader, but with magnification, we don't need to be able to measure the shapes of galaxies, we just be need to be able to measure the number. And so what Young is working on now is whether, like with, with a survey with a, like LSST, whether magnification information might be useful when, whenever we get to a point with the higher redshift clusters where there are not enough galaxies in order to do the, the shear, um, to, to use constraints from shear. Okay, so, uh, okay. and we've been developing, uh, put, trying to put this all together and uh, developing a, a code to fit triaxial models to um, lensing data and to other sorts of data sets that will apply to the HST clash sample. This is from a number of years ago, um, just to show um, constraints on AVOL 1689 for concentration and mass. Um, if you have a, um, try to fit like a triaxial model, you, know, you let kind of the axis ratios um, grow free. And then um, these various other sets of contours are um, assuming you know, that we know the, the Einstein radius from strong lensing, assuming that we have a bias towards halos with a certain orientation to line of sight, and assuming a relationship between the mass and concentrations of halos, we get this sort of contours. These constraints are very poor. Um, this was from some old wide field imaging data, but we are um, like taking this code um, forward in order to be able to fit triaxial models to, um, to data sets. Okay, so um, coming towards the end. So basically, um, we also know that clusters in cosmological simulations, um, they, we see around them um, filaments of, of structure and this is important because we think that about 50% of the mass of the universe is in the form of, of filaments. And a really nice example from your Dietrich in Abel 222-223 is this um, filament connecting those two, those two clusters. So it's pretty uh, difficult to do this um, routinely. And what, what we've been looking at is whether um, 
whether, um, you know, are there any techniques we can use to actually enhance the, the lensing signal? And so in this case, um, again, we've been taking clusters from simulations, generating um, weak lensing data sets and analyzing the, the data. If we just make a mass map, then we're not very sensitive to the, the large scale structure around a cluster. And what uh, James Mead, a former um, grad student of mine did, was to actually develop a technique to um, use the fact that we expect the gravitational shear along the filaments to be in a certain direction and to sort of essentially enhance that signal in order to try to get a better measure of the, the shear along, um, to get a better measure of the mass surrounding galaxy clusters. And we can also fit parametric models. Um, what James also did was um, we looked at stacking clusters from the Millennium simulations. So if you stack, you know, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 clusters, and you know, assume that the filaments come out of the long axis of, of the halo when you do your analysis, then we can get a nice, um, you know, an average kind of picture of the distribution of mass around around clusters. Okay, I think. Um, so I okay. So one final final thing. Um, Alex Barrera, who is was a, a graduate student um, working with Bao Zhuli in in Durham. Um, so we looked at fitting um, normal um, models inside Lambda CDM and model, modified gravity models and um, clusters extracted by Julian Merton from the, the CLASH survey. And basically the point of this is that the black, red, and blue are the different fits you get from Lambda CDM and a couple of different modified gravity models, and they are pretty like indistinguishable, so we cannot distinguish um, like modified gravity models from, from Lambda CDM on the scales of the CLASH observations. So Alex looked at what would happen if we would um, th th if we would instead of looking at the clash observations, which probe out to you know this this would be a megaparsec, so the um, burial radii of the clusters would be around here, and um, these are shown a little bit offset for for clarity. But basically, in the region, uh, the outskirts of clusters where we have like galaxy infall into clusters, then that could potentially be regions where different models of modified gravity could be tested, rather than looking at the, the structures inside the clusters the, themselves. And I'm not too familiar with these modified gravity models, but um, I mean, this, this, it looked to be the, like looking in, in these sorts of regions, like looking at sort of really the very outskirts that are not kind of routinely probed with, um, with weak lensing would be the way to go for this kind of study. Okay, so um, yeah, so I've rushed through this a bit. So basically, um, so the number of clusters and their internal structure is an important probe of our cosmological model and test of gravity. Um, and we, we need to, really, we need to actually, um, this is not my conclusion. Okay, so there is still a lot to, okay, so there's, so we can use um, a variety of, of data sets to probe galaxy clusters. We can use simulations in order to actually um, figure out you know, how important is triaxiality, how important is baryonic physics, and, and so on. And hopefully to um, then develop codes to make, to increase the ability of clusters to actually be used as a cosmological, a cosmological tool.
consistent with the probability of obtaining them in large scale simulations. What's the latest word on that? I think Glenn's more much paper than this one. Right? Yeah. What's, so, what's the story? Well, so some of the old, um, older studies were saying, oh, the, these clusters are very anomalous. Uh -huh. But basically, the most recent simulations, like larger volume simulations that see more of these systems, okay. would seem to say that um, they are not kind of some problem for that the CDM. So okay. I think like a problem was that, that some of the simulations that were being used simply didn't have that many of these systems contained inside them. And so, but with larger simulations I saw maybe last year or so, um, you know, people were saying like they're, they may be rare events, but they're not a problem for Lambda CD. They don't seem to be a problem with that, for Lambda CDM. Has anyone looked at this same question with the simulations, the hydro simulations with variants, or are the volume still too small? Or yeah, so for the hydro, yeah, so the hydro um, simulations, um, so we're at the moment um, using some simulations from the Co Cosmo Owls that have been done by Ian McCarthy, and that's one of the things that we will try to look at with, with Ian's um, simulations. But again, like, like you say, there's been like big advances in um, hydro simulations over the last few years um, in, in terms of the numbers of clusters you can actually, actually, actually study. Yeah. Um, and and what, one of the things we're going to do with, when we do our, you know, our, our simulations using Ramses is to actually, that's one of the things we will get out will be you know, like, the, um, like a good estimate of the velocities and that we can compare it with, with also the large volume simulations. So observationally, you mentioned how many points <coughs> Yeah, so there's about like um, 15 to 20, 15, 20 that are uh, at an angle where you can study them like nicely, whereas uh, you know, if, if they are inclined to a big angle, it's more difficult to disentangle what, what is going on. So this, the, the one we're studying is, is pretty nice because, um, well, I mean, yeah, so, um, but basically because of having the, the two shocks and that also makes it easier to you know, to have constraints on the, the the speeds, the velocities of, of the two clusters by having you know, and knowing that there are two shocks actually there that can be used in, in to help those those sorts of constraints. Um, yeah, and so anything else? Yeah. Somebody else does. Okay, so the, the, the theoretical lore is that baryons make dark matter halo more round. Um, and I don't know that that's actually been seen or applied to clusters in this case. So, I mean, is this, I mean, is this something that's been looked at? Because right. you said the track, so yeah. it's a big deal. Okay. That, that's interesting. So, so that was one of the things I was speaking with Ian McCarthy yeah. on Skype a few, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things he was saying, we can directly compare these large simulations. We can directly compare the, um, you know, the, the models that include baryonic yeah. physics and the yeah and the dark matter of the counterparts. Okay, yeah. that's not that big a portion. That's something. Yeah, so that, that's okay. something that, that we we were talking about like the other stuff that he he suggested that we, we could do that for this for this sample as well. Um, for triaxiality as well, um, if you uh, average over enough halos, so for the lower mass halos, if if you would kind of like take an Average over enough of them at different orientations, um, it shouldn't be so big a problem, you know, to get an average kind of an average measure. The thing that interests me about triaxiality is really the most massive clusters, where you know, if they're very unusual clusters and you want to study them in their own right, then being able to kind of make a you know, and make a triaxial model and you know, to really kind of get at their their properties to me is really interesting. Uh, we've, we've been looking at like computationally, it's kind of um, a very slow process. Um, we've been looking at uh, one of the a student from computer sciences um, is doing a project on trying to implement some of the algorithms for lensing onto GPUs, which, which you know, to me could be a promising way to do these kinds of, of, of calculations.